Hello everyone, it's Oliver here, and you know the drill is to Patreon Q&A, so let's start off with the questions. Connor Brennan, will you do a retrospective for the Incredible Hulk series in the future? It's a good watch, and Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno might be the definitive banner in Hulk. Um, I've not seen the Hulk show for a very long time. I, I saw a few episodes as a kid, but it didn't really interest me that much. It may be sacrilege, because a lot of people love that show. Um, but it's not something I've considered, unfortunately. Do apologise. Whit Rees. Hi Oliver. One, which complete original film score that has not been officially released would you like most to see made available? I think I've answered this question before. Uh, I'd really like to see John Dupree's uh, Ninja Turtles score for the 1990 movie uh, that hasn't been released yet. All you can get is the album of all the, you know, the hip hop, rap music, whatever, but none of the actual proper music. So I think apparently Turtles 2 and 3 have been leaked somehow, So, but they're like really good quality. But, uh, but the first one hasn't been released yet, so... Fingers crossed that comes out soon. Two, as you've done a retrospective on Batman Mask of Phantasm, would you ever consider doing a retrospective on the complete animated series, given that it has officially released scores and video games? Um, yeah, that has that's popped into my mind a few times. I, I only actually own series one and two. I don't think they released season three and four in the UK ages ago. Um, and I think there's a box set that's going to be released, or has been released. I think HMV had some sort of uh, advertisement a while back. I shared it on Twitter, actually. It looked really cool. So if I manage to get hold of that, then I'll look into covering the animated show. Three, what would you say is the best film commentary that you've ever listened to and why? A tough one, really. I've listened to quite a few. Um, I, <laughs> the Simpsons ones are always really good because the writers and you know the producers and stuff are all quite funny people. And um, they've got to you know, talk really quickly and get all the information conveyed in one episode. But um, Ridley Scott's work's always good, like one for Alien and Legend is always a good listen, but it's very difficult to sort of pick one that's going to be the best. I mean, even like Elias Solkind's and P.S. Bengler's for like Superman 3 is quite interesting. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's always difficult. Ridley Scott, though, he's, he's just an absolute pro when it comes to commentaries. Mike Hagon. Oliver, do you think Star Wars has been permanently diluted and or damaged since the Disney takeover? And if so, how do you think Lucasfilm can make the franchise special again, if ever? Many thanks. Um, I don't think it's... I don't think it's really a major fault with Disney taking it over, but I think it's oversaturation. I think there's too many Star Wars related things out and the toys aren't doing as well. Um, so I think there's kind of people getting a bit burnt out on Star Wars and the kind of spin off movies. Uh, and I know what Disney are trying to do, they're trying to kind of copy what they're doing with the Marvel Studios stuff. So, but they don't really have this kind of structure to everything where Marvel have. They've got this, you know, they've got this huge wealth of comics to come to pull from where Disney, I think from the get-go, decided and with Lucasfilm that they weren't going to use the kind of spin-off uh, media, like all the books that came out afterwards and uh, the other stories that were used in the video games. And if they just used them as a sort of template and just pulled some ideas from them, they could have had this kind of interesting kind of storyline where you get a sense they don't know really where they're going with The Last Jedi. So, um, yeah. So I, I don't think it's... People have this crazy idea that you know, when George was involved, the Star Wars was amazing. Remember, the prequels are rubbish, you know. So George had some bonkers ideas, and look at the ideas he brought in for Indiana Jones 4. So it's, it's, I think it was good that he sold the property, but I think Disney need to uh, maybe just kind of slide back a bit or just actually use some of the, the novels that was produced later on, take some ideas from, because there's some great stuff out there. So, yeah, do that. Martin Truesback. Hi Ollie, what do you think of movies like Annihilation being robbed of their international cinema release and being dumped on Netflix? I have seen the movie and with surround sound, but I still think it should have been given a theatrical release. Is this just the way it is now, or is this the new director video release? Um, yeah, that's how it's going to happen. I think many films are going to get released direct to Netflix. Um, but I mean, you know, there is a 4K version of uh, Annihilation coming out soon. I think you can probably watch stream it in HDR, or whatever, on Netflix, but. You know, get the biggest TV you can and the best sound system and you can capture that cinema experience. But I'm sure Annihilation will probably get some sort of, you know, shown in smaller art house theatres over the coming months or years. So there, there will be the opportunity for you to see it on the big screen, I think. But yeah, that, I think there is going to be this push towards more digital streaming instead of a theatrical release. Niall Breen. Hi, Oliver. Congrats on the new studio space. Do you think this will allow you to expand the channel even further? Maybe. I hope so. <laughs> it's, uh, we've got, you know, Richard's doing Fix It In Post flashback. We've got a new series coming out soon. It's due to start next week, Fix It In Post home video. So we're going to make use of it more. 
But um, yeah, I, I think for the time being, it just gives us an opportunity to get out, get out of you know working just behind a computer and just be somewhere to work. And that always improves things because when you work from home, you know, going somewhere else is always kind of helps a lot. You don't feel you know stuck to your computer desk all the time. You can go somewhere to, somewhere else to work. So it's kind of made I think less stressful for me. But um, yeah, I think having this is going to give us the benefit of kind of maybe expanding a little bit more with extra videos. Two, do you have any plans to cover any out and out comedy such as Superbad, The Hangover, etc.? Thanks. Superbad and Hangover, probably not, but uh, I have considered uh, Fish Called Wonder and With Nail and I, which I, I had suggested With Nail and I about two years ago, so I've not got around to it. I still have to do Lethal Weapon, no, Loaded Weapon 1. That's a great film, but there's no soundtrack release for that. I think there's maybe one track, I think, on YouTube, which is just sort of that sort of jazzy kind of 90s, no, no, not 90s, more 80s kind of music. It kind of spoofs, spoofs of Michael Kamen's score to Lethal Weapon. Joseph G, did you go to film school? Do you have any shorts slash feature films that you've worked on that are your own or other people's projects? Will you create a masterclass in the future, diving more into depth on story structure, writing and directing? Uh, I probably wouldn't be doing any sort of masterclass stuff, but um, I didn't go to film school. No, I've got no, you know, qualifications in that regard. Um, so it's all kind of self-taught. I think I've done, I've learned, you know, you make errors and you prove upon them. The more you do, the better you get. So, yeah, I mean, I went, I, sixth form I did. That was, I don't think Americans have sixth form, but it's, um, I did like editing and, you know, media studies, which is pretty basic. You're dealing with VHS, well, super VHS. And that was the first time I ever used Final Cut Pro, the first ever version of it, um, and digital cameras. But yeah, no uh, film school classes I, went, I attended. Frederick St. George. Hello, Oliver. One, if you could pilot any spaceship from any movie or TV series, which one would it be? Oh, I, don't, I don't know, really. Uh, maybe the the car from Galaxy High. <laughs> I, don't, I can't remember. It's just like a, it's kind of like a 1950s or 60s kind of car, isn't it? That kind it's of like a flying like, Cadillac, yeah. It's flying Cadillac, yeah. So it's a bit like what the neutrinos have in Ninja Turtles cartoon. Here you go, that. Two, in historical movies, how important is historical accuracy to you? Um, I don't think it's highly important, but I think they should. They, they can take a few liberties with things, but don't go too far, then it becomes absurd. And if you know about that particular film's history or what they're covering, then it becomes laughable if they've you know, gone a bit too far with it. So yeah, there needs to be a, a point where you can just be a little bit creative with your decisions uh, about the changes of the story, but it's best to try and stay faithful. Three, Kirk or Picard? Kirk, it's always got to be Kirk. Rug speculation. Keep it, keep it going, people. <laughs> Gabriel Woodward, would you consider producing a video on film score? You're the first person on YouTube who makes it a big deal for your reviews and it's a big deal for me. Often it can make a good film great or a bland film good. I'd like a video or a series from your channel of film score importance, originality and favourites, etc. Well, I have done a video on top 10 uh, superhero soundtracks that I love. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen that video. Um, I also thought about doing a James Bond one, uh, top 10 sort of favourite James Bond scores, not the songs, but kind of the scores, but the songs will be part of that, obviously. Um, but I've not really thought about doing just a separate piece on film music. Um, it's something that can happen, but it's difficult to make it happen. So you've got, when you want to isolate music to let people listen to it, to sort of make your point, it can be difficult because the copyright bot kicks in and grabs it and, and record labels are a little bit more challenging than the film studios in getting fair use. So, um, yeah, so if I do tackle another soundtrack related thing, it'll probably be James Bond stuff. Phil Ping, do you have any advice to people who want to do movie reviews, whether it be YouTube reviews or typed out movie reviews? With YouTube or written reviews, it's, you know, it's not a difficult thing, but you just have to be honest you know, with whoever's going to read it, be honest with yourself and make sure what you're, if you're writing something for a website like Letterboxd, whatever, uh, just make sure your, your grammar is good <laughs> and, uh, and make sure what you're writing is interesting. Don't be very basic and plain because other people got to read it. And, you know, and if you're, if you're very good at writing or a bit of a wordsmith, then that's going to come in handy. For videos and stuff, you know, you can kind of talk in a very basic way, but you'd have to make what you're saying sound interesting, how you talk. Um, it's, a, it's a different skill set. Um, but always just be honest with what you, what you want to say. And if you love an old school movie, talk about it. But for new stuff, just do the same. But, you know, people can often 
tell if you're, you know, uh, not being entirely truthful. So, uh, so I would des always be honest and, you know, get your feelings across as to why you love or hate a particular movie. Omar Zambon. Hi Oliver, one, have you ever considered doing a history of series such as the history of the big six film studios and other related subjects? It would be good to get your take on how the film studios have evolved over the decades. Um, not really. Uh, there is a bunch of documentaries already, like, you know, that have been done. I think there's a huge epic one for Warner Brothers on one of their Blu-rays, which someone brought to my attention. I think it might be Gone with the Wind, I think it's on that as an extra. There's one on, I think there's a, I think there may be one on Fox as well somewhere. But I think if it... See, there's, there's, one, there's, a, there's a documentary on Canon, but I don't think there's a documentary on Orion Pictures, as far as I'm aware. Um, so maybe, you know, because at the moment I'm kind of looking to do a crowdfunding sort of Kickstarter with another subject, but I think that, that goes well and coming to next year or the year after, then I may be able to tackle something of that nature. Two, have you ever heard of the comic book character Lobo, who is part of the DC comic universe? If so, do you think this character would fit into a DC EU film? Yeah, I've heard of Lobo. Um, he's popped up in the animated TV show Superman. There's a couple of comics I've got with him. I think he, yeah, he could easily pop up. He'd have to be like a sort of secondary character. I think he'd have to be, once DC go a bit more cosmic, we know, get more bonkers, then he could sort of turn up. Because he's, he's either kind of played for last in some, in like the cartoon, um, but he could be played as quite a menacing kind of threat to Superman. So, yeah, I'd, I'd happily see it happen. But, I mean, he's, he's quite an interesting kind of character to look at. So he'd have to be an actor under a heavy layer of makeup. So, um, yeah, I have no problem uh, with Lobo turning up. I mean, good idea. Matt Green. Hi, Oliver. One, I know you have retrospective reviews on them, but are there any plans to do commentaries on the Indiana Jones films and or Back to the Future? Um, I, th we have, I think this question's been brought up a few times before. I think me and Richard and Duncan have sort of discussed, today. let's do you know, Back to the Future and Indiana Jones, but it's very much a kind of... Uh, because I'd done the reviews at the time, I think when, that, when I was last asked this question... Um, I bit burnt out on Back to the Future, um, but it's it's not out of the question. I and mean, they're great movies, um, and I'm sure me and the lads could have a good time watching them. But it's like um, sometimes more fun to do something that's really schlocky and rubbish, and it's more entertaining for you guys. But um, some people, you know, want us want us to cover popular movies, and they will happen. Two. How do you decide what becomes a retrospective review and which ones will have commentary tracks? Um, generally what I've bought recently, if I've bought something interesting, like an old school film, and uh, I need to cover it. But sometimes it's a kind of last minute decision. I never, I don't look ahead to, to a month or two months. I always say, I'm going to cover the next three films, I'm going to do this and this and this. Sometimes when it's like the second movie on my list, I, I can't find the material at that time. So I have to push it back. Uh, commentaries, the same thing as well, where, you know, I'll say to Richard Duncan, let's do this next week, you know. But if it's like a series we're doing, I always think, oh, okay, I've got, I've got to do the next Marvel film, let's get that slotted in for next week or the week after. But I don't really think that far ahead, so it's all a bit, a bit of a last minute thing. So if you send me lists of stuff, people tend to do, which, which is a bit overwhelming when you get so many requests. You also have to pick and choose as well, you know, what you want to cover. Um, because, you know, one film you could choose, no one's going to be interested in, so you have to be very careful what you pick and not just take every piece of advice everyone throws at you, because most people may not be interested in that particular movie. Sylvester Patushka. Hello, Oliver. Have you seen Aquaman pilot from 2007 with Justin Harley, which was cancelled? Do you think he would have been a good choice if Warner was going for the comic book Aquaman look in their cinematic universe? No, never saw it. Not at all. Uh, I didn't even see the Wonder Woman pilot they, they did ages ago. I just saw stills of it. I don't think I even saw stills of the Aquaman one. I never, actually, to be honest, I've never heard of it. So, um, Richard, does he does he look like the dude from the comics? No idea, mate. Didn't know it existed until 30 seconds ago. There you go. Sorry, we, Mum. Even Richard doesn't know. So. We suck. Two, what do you think of Escape Plan with Sly and Arnie? I thought it was good. I really enjoyed that film. Some people thought it was a bit crap. Um, I quite liked it. It's good fun. I think we. Should, uh, I did promise someone I'd do a commentary to that, which I've not done. <clears throat> which I'll, I'll, me and Richard and Doug will get around to it at some point. The Dark Power. Hi, Oliver. Duncan mentioned the Hannibal TV series during your recent commentary series. For me, Maz Mickelson has become the definitive Hannibal Lecter, as great as Anthony Hopkins is. With TV show budgets and production values coming to rival some movies, I wondered if you'd given thought to covering more TV content on your channel, any shows you're particularly into. Uh, TV shows are always a bit of a challenge um, to get done because, you know, a lot of the American shows in particular, they run for like 20 to 23 episodes per season. If you've got one that's something that's like 10 seasons, you're in, you know, you've got a lot of work to do. And people ask me to just, just throw out things like 
can you review X-Files and Smallville? It's like, you know how big those shows are? They're huge. They take forever and I'll never get anything done. Um, so I had promised people that I'd do Lois and Clark show because I think like four seasons. I bought Captain Power, the uh, show from the late 80s, um, which I wanted to do and it's been sitting on my shelf. But um, I don't know if everyone would be interested in that. So TV shows is always something very, I'm very picky about what I want to cover. You could, doing BBC stuff is a nightmare because they just, they just don't abide by copyright. So I want, I want to do Red Dwarf. I love that show, but that's very long as well in terms of its you know, number of seasons, but it's only six episodes per season. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I'm really umling ahhing about what series I want to do. Um, yeah, so I, I will probably maybe do Captain Power because it's only one season. Easy peasy. Joe Cooper. One, are there any moments in your favourite movies that you hate, such as particular scene, performance, line of dialogue, shot, etc.? Well, my favourite movie is probably is Superman the movie, and the, the moment in that film where Otis is being tracked by the police, I always thought was just a bit too long and a bit dull, and you know, I always used to fast forward it as a kid, and now I just go, well, I still watch it now, I don't tend to skip it that much now, but if you watch the extended cut of Superman the movie, the three-hour TV one, that scene on, goes on for longer. So yeah, probably that scene. Two, Daniel Craig will be 51 when Bond 25 is released. I personally prefer an older Bond. The later films and the actors' runs often see a dip in quality, but their performance usually seems stronger. In what age range do you prefer your Bonds? Um, yeah, I think Bond should be kind of weathered and a bit tired and, you know, burnt out. But I think when they want to do, you know, so many kind of sequels, they tie an actor down to do five. I mean, if you hire a guy in his 50s or late 40s for the first film, then you're going to run into problems because they're going to get quite old. And, and if there's a gap, three or four year gap between... You know, the third or whatever, the second or third Bond film, because due to script problems, you're going to you know, have, have issues. So I think it's probably best to have a Bond maybe in his late 30s so you can kind of slot them in or lock them in to do five Bond films so they won't look too old come the fifth one with uh, like the, the, the issue they had with A View to a Kill with Roger Moore looking like your granddad. Three, realistically, do you think there's any chance that the upcoming Indiana Jones 5, Halloween and Terminator 6 might be good? Terminator 6, probably not, um, but James Cameron is involved. He may have a few ideas up his sleeve, but I'm not holding my breath. Indiana Jones 5, uh, George Lucas is not involved, so they may, you know, have some, you know, maybe have to steer it in a, a different direction. Um, and Halloween, actually, I think Halloween will probably be the most interesting out of the bunch, I think, because we've got a lot of the individuals, you know, involved from the, from the first one. And Jamie Lee Curtis is back. It's crazy. I think Nick Castle as well. So it's going to be, I think John Carpenter's involved, isn't he? I think it's sort of producing level. So yeah, so I'd, I'd probably say Halloween. Um, indie, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of us will get super pumped when there's an Indie Fire trailer. But we have to remember, it may be really rubbish. So don't get your hopes up. But Halloween, my hopes are slightly above average. Well, everyone, that is the end of the Q&A. Coming up on the channel, we've got a Fix It Post home video. We're covering Doomed, the untold story of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. And Richard's got a episode of Fix It Post flashback where he's covering Predators with Duncan. OK, everyone, take care, and I'll see you all next time. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to gain early access to my retrospective reviews, episodes of Fix It In Post, and commentary podcasts, you can pledge to my Patreon. Thank you.